So that summer I came down, my grandmother got sick. I came to Houston to visit her. She missed the past. So while I was here, I said, let me see if I can find the Black Panther Party office here in Houston. So I went driving down Dallas Avenue. And so I saw a sign that said People's Party 2, but it had two panthers on both sides of the sign. So I stopped. So I went inside, I met Thomas and Henry. We chilled and came close and everything. And, uh, and another thing that pushed me over here is I was telling somebody to visit. I was, uh, some of my friends here were having a party. I took some of the people from the Panther Party to to this party. So I came back to drop them off at their office. And uh, these police were harassing these two prostitutes across the street. So we walked in and seeing what was going on. So when I uh, I leave, I get a block down the street, and the police pulled me over. And so uh, you know, I gave them a license and everything. So one of the police said, told his partner, go get your ticket for I said, ticket? I said, I'm going to a ticket for you. He said, you're not getting a ticket. You're going to jail. I said, the jail? You're going to jail for He said, but you don't have no driver's license. I said, I gave him my driver's license. He said, no, you don't have no Texas driver. And I, they took him to jail. So it's things like that. And it's, it's a thing, it's the impression reads resistance. I remember this old cartoon in the newspaper. There was a professor at the board, and he on the board he put up there police brutality plus poverty equals the Black Panther Party. So in other words, if these things were going on, you would have no need for them. I'm going to go ahead and try to take a stab at the question. Because as I was sitting here and I was listening uh, to my elders, to my left, I realized that, like most of my life, I am Black Panther adjacent. <laughs> and uh, what that means is I'm not a member of the Black Panther Party, but I don't have to be a member to honor and respect the work that they've done. Uh, I believe I'm on this panel today for uh, various reasons. One of them being that to be an example to those of us who are here today to know that you don't have to be a member of any organization to care about people and to get involved. Very quickly, my family grew up very poor in New York City. Very, very poor. And when you grew up as poor as they did, New York City at the time, two things can happen. Either you become very bitter and you start to grab for money wherever you can find it and hoard it to yourself, or you can become extremely generous and community focused. Thank God my family became very community focused. Everybody in my family, my mother and her eight sisters and one brother, always spent time working in the community, being very politically aware marching, protesting, serving the hungry, helping the homeless, so forth and so on. My mother used to volunteer at a woman's shelter and she would take me and my brother and she would tell us, I'm taking you to see these people because I don't ever want you to become a man that thinks it's okay to beat on a woman. This was the kind of family I grew up in. The other thing that was important and why I believe I'm here today is they cultivated free thought. My uncle was a member of the Black Panther Party but I didn't realize what that meant. All I knew is he would take me out to go help serve the hungry. Because of the type of man my uncle was, he never entertained questions. But he would talk about the love of people. But also, my mother was a, a, a staunch Christian. In the church that I grew up in, we went and we served the community. And so when we all got together as a family, we talked about the injustice that we saw. We talk about the pain and the struggle. My father's from Central America. And so his pain and struggle was about the fact that he wasn't an American citizen. And so I grew up surrounded in a village and a community that uh, entertained free thought, celebrated one another's differences, and always opened the table to whoever wanted to come and speak. I walked in here today and I saw a brother wearing a garment and I asked him, I said, are you Hebrew? And he proudly said to me, no, I'm Palestinian. And I said to myself, he and I are gonna engage in conversation. The reason why I'm here today, and I'll close this way, 
is several years ago, my wife and I met an incredibly talented, creative young woman named Shawana Dockley. And from the moment we met and had conversations, two things happened. I trusted her creativity, and she trusted me to help her walk as she grew spiritually. About a year ago, maybe a little bit less, she came and said she had a project that she wanted to do. But she was honest with me. She said it's about the Black Panther Party. And she knows the history, unfortunate history that that, that, that is, that when people hear Black Panther Party, they close their doors. And I said, Shawana, that's not what I'm about. I'm about having dangerous conversations. I'm about being comfortable being uncomfortable. So how about we open this Christian church up with this wayward pastor and we have some dangerous conversation? Because the only way we're going to build community, whether it's race, religion, culture, gender, so forth and so on, is to find safe places and safe spaces where we can have dangerous conversation. So that's how I'm here today and that's how I'm a part the Black Panther Party conversation we're having. Thank you. So I follow all of that, but um, <clears throat> I, I was very fortunate to be exposed to a lot as a young child. My mother was a higher education administrator and my father was a jazz and blues drummer. And so between college campuses and bars and lounges and country clubs, <laughs> that was my early life. And with that exposure to music and to um, Black Student Union meetings and to all these different events and seeing what Black students were doing and advocating for on different campuses. Uh, I also was reading a lot. I was listening to John Coltrane and Miles Davis. Uh, I, I just was exposed to that young, and I thought I knew something about life. And then I left Los Angeles and went across the country to New York because I just wanted to make a name for myself. And I was shocked because that was the height of stop and frisk that was under Mayor Michael Bloomberg. I was influenced by Rudy Giuliani. And as soon as I got to New York, I kept having guns put in my face by NYPD. And I was in Jamaica, Queens, which was known as a, a very notorious precinct. Uh, and I was not alone. A lot of my peers were experiencing the same things. A lot of my peers were getting incarcerated right off the college campus. And it was an interesting experience because at St. John's University, it was a predominantly white institution, but they had a, a mission to make a, a very diverse university. So they sent free applications to all these diverse communities. That's how I first heard about them. I never intended on going to New York. And so basically what you got is a school with 20% black population, 20% Latino population, 20% Asian population, 40% white. And nothing on the administration level had changed. The administration was still white. And so they didn't know what to do with us. They didn't know what we wanted. Uh, they didn't know how we wanted to experience college life, uh, but we did. And so I became a, a very early organizer on that campus, a very, uh, I'll put it this way. We were upset because only half of the black students were graduating from that campus within six years. Only one third of the students didn't make it past the first year, just the black students. That was the root of the issue. Then it was all the, uh, NY, all the policing of our events and as soon as we stepped foot off campus, having to deal with that. Uh, and point blank, we just kept on pushing the administration to hire more black faculty, to hire black administrators, uh, to put students in positions of power so we could determine uh, how our campus operated uh, and to increase the budgets for student organizations. And we also got a, a counseling center on campus specifically for black and brown students. And so that movement, uh, it was exciting to me. It was something I loved doing. And I said, well, how do I, like, what career do I go into after this? How do you make money with your life? That's why I'm in college, right? Uh, I don't know if I quite figured that part out yet. But uh, I, uh, what I ended up doing is there were these pipeline programs around research uh, called Summer Research Opportunity Programs. And so every summer, uh, I was at University of Illinois, and I was at uh, UC Berkeley. I spent some time in the Gullah Islands of South Carolina just doing research. And so everything I was passionate about as an activist and as an organizer I got to deepen my knowledge of it. Uh, and so that led me into doing a PhD at the University of California, Berkeley. And let me step back real quick. As an organizer at St. John's, the autobiography of Asada Shakur was our Bible. And I'm not gonna say we fully understood the Black Panther Party. I don't think we did. I think we were taking bits and pieces from it and trying to figure out how we use it today. And so when I got to the PhD program and started learning a little bit more, 
I realized it was by design that we didn't know much about the Black Panther Party, that I never learned about it in my curriculum, that even in the communities I grew up in, it was still taboo to talk about a lot of times. And so I still had a fragmented history of what it was. And so I've constantly just been learning every day more and more about it. And that's why I always say, I, I sit here and I listen to y'all talk about your stories because that's just my job is to listen. I can't recreate this history. I was trained to be a historian, but you guys tell it the best. And so for me, my job is trying to put these pieces together between the party members themselves and the people of my generation, the activists today that are looking for a pathway forward and trying to understand why our history is so fragmented and why we're having issues uh, drawing continuity between previous movements and our current one. Thank you. And now I would like to turn it over uh, to Mr. Emory Douglas. If you can just share uh, your earliest memory of the Black Panther Party as well as any memories you want to share that come to mind when thinking about your work as the Minister of Culture. Uh, yeah, um, I, 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 I did hear you, but it was kind of uh, how. Uh, um, to put a context to it, I was in the back part of the and it was brought in this country during that time. Uh, the guy involved uh, just doing hard work, beginning to come out of the uh, Good rap in the community involved into the Black Arts Movement. And uh, I connected with Brother Leroy Jones, the Mirror Barack, and others during that time when he was out here in the Bay Area uh, while I was at City College of San Francisco, coming out of the Black Arts Movement. And when City College, this was during the, 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 the time of the uh, Black college movement, black power movement in the structure. It was involved in development. This is the time when we were beginning to define ourselves for ourselves as opposed to the colonial name of Negro that was given to us. As a whole, and we did find ourselves as African, African American, all over the very very book. And uh, it was involved with the uh, city college of San Francisco, getting involved with the naming, uh, changing the name of the Negro Student Union to the Black Student Union. And there were a lot of challenges. There was a brother out there who named McCrone Young, who was a jazz musician, who had a radio show, radio show on the local uh, radio station, who was the one coordinating that, that, that activity at the time. And we were, it, took, it was a challenge, but we got successful. We were able to achieve our, our goal. At the same time, um, I was involved with some brothers from San Francisco because, you know, it's a thing that you had all across the country, you had young black being murdered, all of being justified, and we're trying to figure out what to do and how, how we could be, you know, get involved. And one of those brothers who I was, was uh, named Hank Jones. Hank Jones was one of the brothers who became a part of the San Francisco 8. Catholic school who were in New Orleans, he got tortured back, uh, and you can read that, uh, you can, uh, you got a film called Legacy of Torture. You can see it online, take that whole story. So, you know, so, uh, and so that, I got in that uh, group of Hank, and uh, going back and forth to San Francisco State, because a lot of cultural activity was going on out in San Francisco State. And when the river Barack was out there, uh, I began to do simple props, backdrop with play, community theater, what happened. And it was during the time that they were, there was, Hank came to me and said, he knew it would be an artist as well, an you know, artist in the black art movement. And he asked, he told me that they were paying a, a, a meeting to bring Sister Vincent Mass to the Bay Area. And they wanted me to do the postal for that event. And I, he said, I put you in this meeting. And when I, I got there, I agreed. Then they said there were some brothers who would come over to the next meeting to let them know if they would do security for that event. Uh, when we came over, that was you and I was 
stayed on the podcast and he was the first that first to graduate. It was after that day that I knew I, I, that's where I wanted to be a part of. And I asked him how I could join. I hear him in my head to get his car, to get the car. I used to have a car in there, so I used to take the bus over to Hewitt's house, to that Hewitt, show around the neighborhood, because I was living in San Francisco. And then we'd go by by the sales house. That was my first involvement in transition from being in the Black Arts Movement into the Black Panther Party in late, early, late January, early February of 1967. Very initially, uh, we were going out on patrols um, as an observer in the community, when observing in relationships to the harassment that was going on by the police during the time. Because they had already done the training and stuff, so they said that you go as an observer in the street. And so I did that. Going fast forward, also during that period of time, there was a young brother named just up now, who was murdered by the original police, which is about 45 minutes drive from San from Oakland. Oh, he was, if, if there's no traffic, get there 20 minutes. And uh, they were helping the family with that, with, with his murder. And it was suggested that uh, they look for the Martinez, the Martinez, because Richmond is a unincorporated area. Needs to be run by the marshals, the, uh, the sheriff's department, because it didn't have a, like a, a, a city government, unincorporated area. And then at that time, so uh, we went out to Martinez, which was in town at that point now. Uh, I remember and when we went out there and tried to go into get some information and talk about it. What it happened to the young couple who was 13 years old, shot in the back. I mean, 13, 17, shot in the back. They shot Christ, claiming that he was justified. And so, but what happened, we had to come, come to people. It was written in the Constitution. Even on the control, never interfered with the, uh, the arrest officers or whatever. Stepped in the legal distance away. Explain to young brothers and sisters who were being arrested their rights. Now, all they had to do was get a name and address for them for the 14th of the minute. Seem to still say nothing. And then, you know, we had to run out of state that we would try to come to bail them out. If we could, but on time to time, that didn't happen. They were bailed out. So, we're going back, we're going to go back into uh, Richmond, I mean, to uh, Martinez, and just another hour. No, that was something that was set up early on that was very judicial that they got involved with. And they were thrust into this, they locked, they locked, locked me, the jail out there. We were just there. After he was in tents, out front, wanted to go in, to talk to whoever was in charge about the murder of this guy. So it was like standing out in the system. That they locked the doors. They wouldn't let us into the sheriff's department. They're going to be able to talk to uh, to the uh, to the authorities in charge. So that after the problem that people got, they see any of them with guns, all those things, they just don't have a right to move them out. So like the next show, the most first show that in, that was over. We done. Going fast forward, um, in the big community, all the nine big community. North Bridgeport was an unincorporated area. And another place, Emeryville, which is right next to the Oakland, is also an unincorporated area. And you may, if you, some of you who read the Black Panther newspaper, we begin to talk about black people moving into those areas that are become unincorporated, meaning that they didn't have government, that you just set up your own police department, you just set up your own city, you made your own city kind of all that, your own everything. You control that because it's unincorporated. It didn't happen. So if you wanted to and did that, that would, you could do a wish all around the North Bridge. We talked about the issues uh, during that period of time. And it just so happened that it was the sisters and others 
in a place called East Alabama, which is named again now. They heard that. And almost 20 years, about some years later, they did that in East Alabama. And they changed the name from East Alabama to Nairobi. And for over 20 years, it was called Nairobi. But of course, it was built in, of course, it was not the real kind of thing for that. And they know that this state no much that wanted to be successful until she was gone. We let the line customer. We let all kinds of protected money, all things to do to reform the city government. So we initially had to change and give it up and change the name back to uh, uh, East Carolina. At the same time, I remember going around April of May. Second was when the first newspaper came out about Sacramento. When we went to Sacramento, we went to Sacramento, and it was a collective of families, a lot of community people, brothers who had organized, a song, and some of the families that came down to our family went to Sacramento. We went just a little bit of family delegation, but it was all families. There were men and women a part of that delegation to Sacramento. And it was explained that morning before we went that while we were going there, we were going there to observe the legislation in the context of them in the right way to assemble them to change the local drug part. Because they couldn't deal with you and the first time they passed it. I'm standing law. You can truly manage it. And here in the black people, people use the Constitution, which is what led to them to articulate the relationship with the blacks. And so they weren't changing those paradigms. And so we explain why you could, this is very interesting, eight stages of organization. So it's explaining to us why both you and them are united. Because the need one need to stay back if we got arrested. So the other one to deal with the uh, with new people. So I was still the one who led the delegation. We still walked, we took you down and put them in the trunk, and we traveled to Sacramento. When we hit Sacramento, it just so happened that then Ronald Reagan, who became the president of the United States, the day after, was then the governor of the city of California, who was there about 10 feet away. He was talking to, to some parochial school kids, the press seen us, and they came over to where we were, and Bobby Seal was there. And Bobby Seal read the executive mandate, they said, why we were there, and read the executive mandate, executive mandate number one, which is about the daily uh, about the time concentration camps. He was saying, today he was called a prison industrial complex. Mm -hmm. I was planning in relationship to a prison by people and people of color. Uh, in these institutions, in these, uh, in these, in these, in these institutions, they, as they have, as you see, it has happened today. Man, how can we just think after we were really, really charging with the that, we break the rules of travel with the that, they were throwing us in, walking to stay, which was news media. News media followed us up, we tried to find a change for the law on these plans. So once we get up there, they knew you could go into the chamber, and the first thing is all the uh, Congress representatives say, get the gun, get the news, get the camera. We follow that in. They say, well, get the gun, I need it. And we go, get them from our house, go, 10 minutes, we go to the negotiation about a couple blocks away. The next thing you have is you have this policeman come out and go to the cell in the back, put the gun in the trunk, he get on this. What it is, and next day you know they zoom down, they arrest them, they take your gun, they jam them, all these kinds of things that make them in violation of the local gun law. Just to jail, they go on the shirt, go back and forth. The party is growing from this because the, in, the, in, the, in the country, the intensity of the situation, the murder that they justified. You had 25, 50, 100 black being murdered in the criminal revenge that was taking place in this country during the 50s, in the 60s. And so we, you had all these parties broke, and so we made a deal, and Bobby had said they didn't know who all had guns. And so they wanted to people, seven to eleven people, plead guilty. And who can get that? I was 
we want to go show the people, and we're going to be able to uh, not supervise this thing. We would have to go back and forth. Therefore, we would be going to do this also be dealing with the organizing that needs to be done as part of the community development. And what happens then is that we come back for three years, not just to this meeting, and we get ready to walk out for it. And he said, no, 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 y'all want to chill. So he set us up the same suggestions. Mm -hmm. So now that, if the blood has been there, we all get out there and this is very sad. April, you will look at Dr. Stillman at connection with Elf Street. You will see him every right. He was uh, in prison and got out. And you will try to connect him to right, the editor of the paper. And this is at a place called Black House. How close are you to Barbara Nix and others, Sophie Carr, all of them used to come out here. Yeah. And the culture just stuck with down there. There's a whole picture now. The one street who lived up there. He knew who used to come over, go up the top of the house, trying to recruit him. Now we sometimes be down there. And then the one that's there, that one was nothing happening. I was working on that first issue of the newspaper, which is a big size screen. They did have about 14. And it was about to be sent out. And I stayed there working on that because I went to City College and took up the first law of advertising art. I told them to have a group of people. And so I stopped working on material and, and I'd be right back. It took me about 45 minutes to come to go. But I came back. They said, well, you know, we finished with this one. About to stand at this gentleman's back right now. And that gentleman walked with the headline. And they had been run up on the conference, really right to see. And he said, well, we finished with this one. And, uh, but you seem to be committed, because this is April now. They came out this year, since of January. And they said, you seem to be committed, we're going to start the paper. And we want you to be, you be the, you, if you were first, you'll be the revolutionary artists. And the vision, you become the minister of culture. They had a whole vision. They said, it would tell the story, it would tell the story from our perspective. They be out about the double S war, you can praise you on the one hand and criticize you on the other. And so that began, that was the beginning. The first paper, tabloid paper we had was about the next month. When we had we had what's the second paper? What's the second paper? Um a May second, which was on a month to month. But we had one to go on May Day, month to May Day was so we had to call the college and get on that money. And uh, that paper was about Sacramento. It was there after that when I began to work on the newspaper. Uh, and, and the hope that we didn't have uh, an even social headquarters there. They got an office where they used to go and have some community needs. They do a lot of training and some technical training and stuff. But Patrols, and everything was in the context of the patrol was legal. Wasn't a violation of any law, none of that at all. And so um, I started working on that, when I started working on that, that paper, it was the second issue, uh, first tabloid issue, but uh, the second issue of the uh, Black Panther Party newspaper. Uh, uh, as the revolutionary order from the district became the Minister of Culture. Now, when you talk about the context of culture and what happened, we were creating the culture. As we evolved, as we developed. I mean, it was like we had 50 years of experience. This is a youth movie. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 years of age. I was not, maybe I was 21, 22, going 23. You knew 23. Bob Still and Eric Van Howard, they were just, they were the old folks of Boston. And he had to get no longer happy because they were first member. They met on him before he was in the park. And when they joined, he got permission from his brother and they wanted him to be coming in the park. So there was a structure always there, consciousness of the thing. And it had to take that, I think, going back on the 